Okay, so I'm guessing uh, as, a, as a guest host, Lee, you'd like me to start off with episode well, 40? Well, that, that, that's normally what presenters do, isn't it, Chris, lad? <laughs> like, they kick things off and introduce the guests. And... Well, I was uh, just a little nervous because I, I found Taylor's job mostly consisted of keeping uh, Mr. Lee Addison under control. So, Oh, mate, well, you know, <laughs> trust me, I'm going to give you a run for your money, lad, you know? <laughs> And expecting it. <laughs> so oh, welcome to you both. How are you? How you going, mate? Yeah, doing really well. Doing really well. And we uh, may or may not have James Varley joining Yeah, he just said he's going to try. He's going to try. He's a spare bus driver or something. So. Well, that's better than him trying to do it while he's driving the bus, I guess. <laughs> so big week for you, Lee. You've been up and around the, the state. Oh yeah, I'm covering. I'm covering some kilometres. I've actually been interstate technically because I've been in Balamble. So I mean, I live just south of Brisbane. So what's absolutely crazy to me, and I'll never get my head around this, is that I can drive forty minutes south, and and the time zone is an hour different. And I've spent some time in Coolangatta today. And if I was at one end of the street, it was New South Wales time. The other end of the street, it was Queensland time. I, I, I just can't get my head around that. I, re- I really can't. Uh, and it certainly has ruined New Year's Eve for me, living so close to the border. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been busy, mate. Busy just driving everywhere. Bewa, Balamble, um, clinics coming up over the holidays, as you know. And I'm booked out about four or five weeks in advance at the minute, which is a real good thing. So uh, yeah, I Fantastic. really appreciate all the love out there, that's for sure. Fantastic, and it's uh, only going to get busier, I think, Lee, with with what I've seen, and and you know, as as a parent and, and a grandparent, really, it's um, holidays are always a time where you're looking for something for the kids to do, and that's right. You know, as footy footy heads, we're always looking for something to uh, <laughs> help, help them play footy too. I guess that's right. That's right. I'm trying to think who Sorry. Tim reminds me of with his glasses on <laughs> and his beard. I'm trying to think who it is. It's some something's jumping out at me, and I just can't put my put my finger on it. Oh, I don't know if it's you know some axe murderer or something like that, or I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to. Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get started, hey? Why not? I uh, saw in the NRL news or on the NRL app that uh, in Graham Ennis Lee's weekly review, he's come out and said that it is the closest. NRL season after round four since 1908. So whether that's as close as 1908 or whether it's because 1908 was the first season and this is actually the closest ever. So uh, I wanted to ask you guys if you had an opinion as to why that might be the case. Statistically, it's is it, is it factual? Is it factual? Statistically, there's more games decided by a lower margin than, uh, than ever before. Okay. And that, I assume, they've counted in... The fact that it used to be three points for a try and whatnot. And... Oh, I don't know if they've, they've um, factored that into it, actually, Lee, whether or not it's... Uh, they only mentioned, in the article I saw, they only mentioned actual points difference. So, okay. Um, so to, your, to your question, mate, about why it might be happening, salary cap, um, the preferred teams, the more fancy teams having more players in the World Cup, more of a stand down period, a mandated stand down period. So they're just starting a little bit slower. That would suggest that would suggest that that could pull some scores a little bit closer. The fact that Redcliffe have joined the comp, we've now got a talent spread over seventeen teams rather than sixteen, is probably is probably a factor. I don't think any of them jump out like dogs, you know what, as the as the reason. But I think they probably all contribute something. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I think it's a combination of everything that's actually why they are so close. Um, a lot of the player movements from different teams, I've seen where some of the, um, say, Penrith Panthers, where they were extremely strong, trying to cover those positions where those where some of the players have left and mm-hmm. gone to other clubs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that there could be part of the reason mm. um, that or there's a lot of teams have really picked up in the off season where the top teams have been at for a while mm. yeah that 
I think as the years have gone on, Tim, I think the and sports science has evolved, and rugby league's knowledge of sports science has evolved, and its ability to afford it. The teams that need to start well are the ones that had a poor previous season. So they front load their work. I think we had this discussion last week, actually. So they're getting yeah. even better, I think, as, as a rule of starting the season better if they need to. I think that is a little bit of the Broncos, if I'm honest. I think they've had a huge preseason. I think the Cowboys, by all accounts, went really hard last preseason. This preseason, it's not been quite as big, and that is reflective of their performances. That's just a combination of players who were away at the World Cup, but also subconsciously, you know, it, when you're the when you're the hunted rather than the hunter, it's a different mentality, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So there's all these machinations at play too. Um, Would also the um, the the players, some of the key players in a lot of the teams that are out due to suspension as well. Yeah, an injury. I mean, it's like a mass unit at every club at the minute. The numbers are ridiculous. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but if you look on the NRL website and look at the casualty ward, you have to scroll down your phone quite a significant amount. Um, apparently, as as internet phone users, we scroll the equivalent of the Statue of Liberty in length a day, and I would imagine a big chunk of that is scrolling down the casualty ward list of the NRL <laughs> teams at the minute because... Um, it is significant, and you always start to see it around about round four, round five, round six. So, yeah, that, that's a factor. One thing I would like to say, though, is I don't think, like last year and the year before, I thought there was quite a few poor teams. And I look at Titans' performances last year, Tigers, of course, Newcastle Knights, Dragons, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's jumping out just yet. I don't think the poor teams are that poor. Newcastle got a good win at the weekend. Tigers are obviously struggling, but I see a lot in there that as soon as it clicks a little bit, they could get some wins up. They just need a few things to stick. I mean, they certainly caused Melbourne some trouble the other day, but they just couldn't sustain it. And the Bulldogs. uh, Yeah, the Bulldogs, I think they were up and down in that Warriors game too. So, you know, I, I do think these... Lower base teams are up in their game as well, but soon the big boys are going to come to the party. Um, and does depth play a part in that too, Lee or Tim? Uh, in the sense that as the injuries do mount up and the suspensions, the I, I guess there's an opinion or the, there's um, a, a level of thinking out there that the the better clubs have better depth too, because you know they can attract more players. Of higher profile and well, there's that, but don't forget because we're a salary cap sport, there's only so many top players you can sign. So, what comes into play is your youth development system, and that's where your Penriths of the world have an advantage. Parramatta do okay, the Roosters are pretty good at uh, getting kids in from different areas and into their junior development system, so they have their own way of doing it, which is successful. But Penrith are certainly the benchmark in that sense. Melbourne Storm are up there too. So they're the clubs that tend to go okay. The reality is, I mean, I think you've just got to finish top four. And I think that as the years go on, there's going to be less and less teams push for that minor premiership and just finish top four. Because one of the things that's happened is that this final series has stuck around for a while. Whereas for a few years, we were chopping and changing the final series. So now we've had this, whatever system it is, called, but you get a massive advantage if you're in the top four. So you just need to finish in the top four. So if it isn't, if it is, and on the NRL app, which is um, obviously biased towards a bit of PR from the NRL themselves, they attribute it to salary cap. Uh, Is there... A, a bit of a bugbear of mine is every year that something seems to change. The media comes out and wants something changed and, and the NRL tends to be a little bit reactive to that. If we now are in a situation where it's the closest, should they leave it alone for a little while? Leave what alone? Well, the game. There's Do you mean in terms and, of rules? and 
Yeah, yeah, rule changes. There's always tinkering. And uh, it's, my opinion is a lot of it is in response to media. And, um, you know, the, the media tends to, I think, assume that the public wants to see high-scoring games necessarily, although um, this tends to buck that trend in the sense that games are closer. Um, I just, I guess I just asked the question, you know, what if things are going well, should we leave it alone? Well, I think it's a bit too early to say that this trend's going to continue. I've got to be honest, I can see the Dolphins copying a few hidings this year just because of their newness, <laughs> you know, their new combinations and, and whatnot. You know, if, if they've got too many players out one week and a few key ones are missing it, and it's just a not been a great week, whatever, they, they could cop a couple of hidings. That's just part of their journey, I think, this year because they're still going to roll teams. Um, the Tigers, if they win a game in the next five, it will be seen as some kind of rugby league miracle based on what we've seen because they've got a really bad draw mm. coming up. I'll check it for you when Tim's talking, but it's a real tough draw. So they could be non and eight. And when you are losing game after game after game, you would have thought that soon, there's only so many times you can say, well, we lost that one, but we could have won it. Or we're getting better. Our processes are getting better, boys. But oh, good look, it's another defeat. There'll, be, there'll mm-hmm. come a time when, you know, they're just down tools at some point. And there could be anybody, you know, the Bulldogs are showing some frailty. There's enough team showing a bit of frailty, I think. Only a bit, not a lot, just a bit. And it, it all depends how big that bit gets. So you mentioned Redcliffe and uh, the great, well, you didn't mention the great game, but I thought it was a fantastic game. And I wasn't there, but I have heard and spoken to some people that were there on Friday night that it was one of the best atmospheres at Suncorp for an NRL game. Were either of you two guys there? I wasn't with you, Tim. No, no, I wasn't there. I watched it at home and just from the way it came across on the TV, it the it was origin like. The mm. even in the interviews afterwards with the players and some of those players who'd played Origin, they even said that it was like an origin. I had to laugh. When the dolphins ran out there was a lot of cheers, and when the Broncos run out, there were quite a lot of boots. It felt like there was more Dolphins fans Dolphins. in there. Yet when Stags was going full length of the field, it felt like four-fifths of the stadium were cheering <laughs> for Stags. So I reckon there's a few of them who had a, a cheek on each seat kind of thing. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so that made me laugh. But I think it's a sign that people are questioning in the southeast Queensland region which team they follow. I do like the fact Sorry, I do like the impact the Dolphins have made already. I don't remember the Titans having this kind of impact when they arrived. No. And if anything, you know, they they could have they could have made some kind of rivalry out of it too. They're at you know different ends of a motorway. So, um, well, they tried know, it with the Crushers as well, mm, the Queensland Crushers when they first came in. Yeah. The Seagulls. And it I think never... all, all hats off, all hats off to the current NRL administration. Really, I mean, you drive around Brisbane at the minute, and I'm not saying the NRL have done this, but I'm sure they've had some kind of say in it. There's banners everywhere. It's either a dolphin or a Broncos banner on the lamppost. It, it has. There has been a genuine buzz being created. I was in the. Uh, I happened to pass a pub on Saturday, Chris, and um, I went you past it. it. Yeah, I went in it just to check. You know. Nobody was drunk and, um, you know, I was just talking to a couple of the locals and apparently on that Friday, it was in the city, though the pub still is in the city, uh, the, uh, that Friday the, the place was jam-packed and so was everywhere else. I mean, it, it must have just been me and Tim at home in the <laughs> southeast Queensland region, I think, on, on Saturday, so or Friday, sorry. So Yeah, there was a real buzz and I think uh, I, I live on the north northern side of Brisbane and I work in not too far from Redcliffe with people who are, they're wearing both hats and some, like you said earlier, Lee, um, there's some died in the wall Broncos members that I work with who 
uh, they're struggling to decide whether or not they'll keep the Dolphins as their second team or whether they might at times become their first team. So, And I think what's helped is the way they've started. So they've played with a lot of pride. You know, they're not the flashiest team on earth, but even if they'd have lost to the Roosters, lost to... Um, who did you play in the second game? Uh, Canberra and lost to Newcastle. They, the way they are playing is with heart, with spirit, with pride. And I think that gets a lot of fans' vote. And if you top that off with a victory as well, then that just adds to the value. So I think that just the way they're having a red hot crack, I mean, I think they want even more friends on Friday night. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Well, I've really noticed do. it on the drive. Over the last two, three days, you even see some of the trucks and everything. They've got the Dolphins um, paraphernalia on their trucks on one side and Broncos on the other. And that's <laughs> that, That's coming down into New South Wales. I'll tell you what, you never catch me with a Man United thing on. <laughs> Only Man City. <laughs> uh, so, if the buzz is real i read in i don't know where i read it actually but uh just recently peter Beattie, uh who is still i believe a commissioner on the arlc responded to a statement from gillan mclaughlin who's the head of the afl uh, a statement that gillan mclaughlin said that the afl will be more popular in queensland in two to three years than rugby league did either of you see that statement? Have you have you got any rebuttal against that? Or um... I didn't see it, but I've got a rebuttal. Over to you. I fear he's right. Is that that doesn't count as a rebuttal, does it? Or does it? I I'm not contesting it. We I... we the game the game did not allow Ipswich to put in a ladies team. In the, I think the BND Premiership, BMD Premiership, hmm. that same area housed the AFL W Grand Final last year, and a lot of players have got, have decided to go and try AFL as a result. And you don't have to go far to talk to people who say that there's more and more kids playing AFL at this school than used to be or in this area that used to be or the field next to us is full of AFL uh, kids and it never used to be. I remember, it might have gone back now, I don't know, but I remember once being in Ipswich and the field at the school, Blair School called Alan Langer Field, people were complaining that there was no rugby league played on it anymore, but AFL was. Mm. And they are swarming all over us. I know that there's a school right in the heart of Logan. They have been offered significant investment to house a, uh, uh, an AFL program. And nothing is a problem. They have got resource. They've got strategy. Uh, going further afield, I know that being at the tip of Queensland, right up here on the map, um, somewhere up there, the... The schools that I've visited, they tell me that the AFL are flooding them mm. with development officers, with resource, yeah. pre-resource, yeah. post-resource. So, <clears throat> I mean, two or three years might be a bit of a push, but I'd hate to be having this conversation in a decade. But there is the Dolphins now. <laughs> so... You know, we can't we, we can't talk highly about the dolphins and then forget they exist in the next conversation because that will have an impact on all the kids in that region and in the southeast Queensland region. They've now got three teams locally that they can aim for to be NRL juniors and then hopefully NRL players. So they've got something else that they can that they can dream about. They've got three teams they can support. They just the fans they can go to a game every weekend now in South East Queensland that they never used to be mm. able to. So I think that that on one hand is a positive, but because we didn't go to Ipswich with the NRL franchise, and because 
the ladies didn't get a shot at the BMD Premiership this year. I think that was a competition they were trying to enter. Um, yeah. They they've they've also almost got an open goal at Ipswich now as well. Hmm. So yeah, I'm of the same the same as Lee. I've just seen it in the schools themselves on how much information is given to the PE teachers in primary school and how many clinics that the AFL are trying to run. All they have to do is make a phone call and they get back to them straight away. Where with rugby league, they it takes quite a bit of time to to get for them to get information and there's no real follow up on it. Where with mm. the AFL, they're following up every, at least once or twice a week. Do you want this program? Can we help? How can we help? You ask look, if you want help, you suggest what we can do and we will do it. Look, I'm heavily involved in um, schoolboy and girl, sorry, sport. Um, I'm still waiting for an email or a call back from any NRL development officers. We are literally 10 minutes down the road from, the, uh, from Dolphin Oval. We also have a school oval which has AFL posts on it. We don't play much AFL at all, but the local AFL club uses our school ground as their home ground, the junior club. I am consistently disappointed at the lack of follow-up, the lack of resourcing and lack of communication from the NRL. We want Our kids want to play rugby league. We can't get them into competitions at the moment because we're not, uh, we're not at a level high enough to play in the Tier 1, Tier 2 competitions. We're uh, not a state school, so we're not involved in the Wednesday afternoon competitions. We want to play in some of the after-school competitions. We're still waiting to hear back, and we get promised callbacks. We get promised um, contact, and all we hear is crickets. And, and it's just incredibly dif- disappointing. And I, I've had an opinion for a long time that rugby league succeeds in spite of itself at times because um, it's a fantastic game, but far out there's times when it's run by just absolute. Uh, we want to keep this as a clean rating, don't we, Lee? So I won't finish that sentence. And one of the head NRO guys, coordinators, is leaving. He's going down to the Titans as a, one of their coaches. Is this in the area of South East Queensland? Yep. Okay. Okay. And he's been, he's been involved with the Titans, but they've obviously offered him a full-time gig. Mm-hmm. And he's grabbing there you it. Go. Yep. There you go. Mm. At least he's still in rugby league, though. <laughs> yes, yes, that's it. Yeah. I remember. The other thing is, is that with the with the NRL clinics coming out, they can only use they can't use volunteers. So, like myself, I'm retired. I can't go and help them do any of the, their clinics. Why? Because it's not covered. I'm not covered by their insurance. Hmm. That's why everyone should just do aim higher. <laughs> Never misses a chance. <laughs> Very true. You too could aim higher. <laughs> and that's what that's also why there is a market for services like yours, Lee, because the NRL hasn't filled that gap and people are screaming for it. That's that, that's mm-hmm. how I found you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I won't say any more. Shall we move on? Mm-hmm. Uh I do want to bring up, I think we could talk about it for quite a while, but we may not have time. But uh, does anybody remember a time when the Australian Rugby Union enticed people like Wendell Saylor, Matt Rogers and Lottie Takiri over? And uh, are we seeing something similar again with uh, Suali'i and his reportedly $1.6 million per year over three years? contract which uh before i ask you two gentlemen to comment i also read around this that um someone called mcclellan who is uh an official with uh aru was quoted as as saying it is a strategic decision to help them generate a uh, higher bid for their next media rights negotiation what do we think about 
So are you going to Union? Not a shock. He came from Union, so not a shock. Good luck to him. I wish him all the luck in the world. He's come out and said he's going in 2025. It's not like the Roosters can't prepare for his departure. Um, to me, that's case closed. You know, I hope to see you back there again. I, I think what's jumping out is the way the Roosters have responded. They're all in support of him. Mm. You know, negotiations are one thing, but, you know, the, the, the person himself and his right as an employee is another. And he's still employed by the Roosters until the end of 2024. So, for me, crack on. Um, until we get rid of the salary cap or we have some kind of dispensation for to pay people some money, they're going to continue to seek other opportunities such as boxing, such as rugby union. It's not that long ago players defected to AFL to, to try it out. And gridiron, so NFL. Mm-hmm. Um, they wouldn't be doing that if we were paying them enough. So what they're doing is they are looking at their career. They're looking at the window they have from the age of 17 to 31, 32, 33, 34, whatever it is. And they're trying to maximise their hmm. their earnings. And they've got every right to do that. And I think Sonny Bill paved a little bit of the way for that. And I think if Sonny Bill stayed at Canterbury, he would not be a household name in, a, in Japan or in South Africa. Around the world. Or America. Or, you know, list any rugby union playing country. Hmm. They all will know who Sonny Bill Williams is. If he didn't make that switch, they wouldn't know who he is. And there's no doubt Sonny Bill's brand is almost as, as big as any club he joined. You know, like when he came to the Roosters, their crowd went through, their crowds went through the roof. So to me... Joseph Suali, he is making a great decision for his own brand, for his own future. A lot of commentators and a lot of people on social media only look through the prism of Australian Rugby Union. It's not just about Australian Rugby Union. It's about the world game. Suali, he will play in a World Cup. He'll play against the British Lions and he will be a household name. Um, You know, most people in Australia know who Israel Folau is and it's not because he played for Melbourne and it's not because he played for the Broncos. So, Some may I, say it's not because of his sport at all. Lee. Yeah, maybe, but the, you know, the reality is they know him. The reality is they know him and the reality is because of who he played for at the time, the social media posts he did got the traction that they did. And mm. it, it, it may have got traction on the Eastern seaboard if he was still at an NRL club, but it, you know, it, it, because, it because of the, and it got attention the world over. Yeah. I listen to a lot of English talk back radio still, especially when I'm driving home from clinics and it was a lead story on some of those. It wouldn't have been, if he played for one of the NRL clubs. And that's the Absolutely. difference. Absolutely. That's the difference. And, and so... Joe, sorry. Well, yeah, I was going to bring it back to, to Joseph Sueli. Nobody, I, I don't certainly don't begrudge him at all. And it goes both ways. I mean, rugby league's benefited from uh, union people coming over. There's uh, you know, an up-and-coming I mean, gun for the Newcastle Knights at the moment. Um. Tim, you know what? You know a lot of players go over as well just to give the body a bit of a rest. Absolutely, absolutely. Because it's, I mean, it's, it's a less impactful game. Yeah, and you get paid more for it. Well, why wouldn't you? Absolutely, absolutely. Any rugby yeah. union clubs want a rugby league coach who goes around doing clinics? Give me a shout. Say top dollar. That certainly <laughs> happened before, especially in the defensive areas of the game. That's right. That's right. Tim, you were going to say something. Um, just that. Yeah, the the cross code switch. It's not as I don't think it's as as big as as what it's made out to be. Like he's come from Union. The amount of Union boys that rugby league teams have grabbed, Kalen Ponga, is one. 
they've paid big money for them to come over to rugby league. Why can't rugby union do exactly the same? And you know, there's some I, NRL clubs as well that put their young kids in rugby union schools because they don't want them in rugby league high schools because they prefer to coach them themselves. So anybody who's developed a love for rugby union, why can't they go and play the sport they love? But as far as yeah. I'm concerned, surely he loves rugby union and deserves a you know deserves to play it if he wants to. We don't whinge about people who go boxing or you know we don't we don't complain about people who go on a. Um, I'm sorry to compare the two, but if somebody went on a mission for two years, yeah. we don't sit there yeah. and say, "Oh, let's stop and play rugby league" because they're going on a mission. For two Do years. we? Do we either then say that they shouldn't be considered for origin, as Phil Gould has come out and said? That's to me. That's Brad Fittler's prerogative, and that's the selectors' prerogatives. Samoa, New South Wales, and whatnot. And but as long as he's contracted in the NRL and playing NRL football, he's he should and uh, he's. Uh, his, his, his heritage and whatnot makes him eligible, then he should be eligible, eligible in my opinion. But if Brad Fittler wants to put somebody else there because he wants one eye on the future, that's fine too. I don't mm. think he can be banned. From my memory, Israel Folau played Origin right up until yep. it was time for him to go. And that I probably think... tells you something about how... Queensland treats its players. It's too, the same well, with you know? Lottie Dakiri and Wendell mm-hmm. Saylor. They played. Mm-hmm. They played. But the other thing is that they didn't give the amount of time. See, this is Suat Suat mm. Lee has given everyone so much time, like mm. two years, yeah, to to get over the fact that he's going to Union. Like he's, Gaznia went he's, across. Mark Gaznia. Yep. Mm. The other thing, staying Lottie true Takiri, to his contract. Lottie Takiri actually coaches rugby league now at community level and junior rep level. Yep. So he wasn't lost to the game. No. Um, Wendell commentates and contributes left, right and centre off the field. You know, you, you treat these people right, they stay with the game. I mean, didn't we get didn't we get Sulehi from Union? Really? Yes. That's so it. is yeah. he asked yeah, and to all play three. about? Or? <laughs> Wendell, Lottie, Matt Rogers, all three came back to rugby league and mm-hmm are still involved to some degree in rugby That's league. Right. That's right. Do you think, do either of you think Phil Gould would say the same thing about, because Phil Gould's come out and said, go now. He signed his, he's, he's uh, given his intention that rugby union's where he wants to be, go now, show him the door. And I think his quote was something around, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. Would mm-hmm. he say that same thing if uh, Sue Lee was playing for the Bulldogs for the next no. two years? No, no. definitely not. You, you gentlemen aren't telling me that Phil Gould's a little self-interested, are you? No comment. What he does do is says something controversial on 100% footy every week so that it gets traction throughout the week. So if you watch it and you look, you can tell he's trying to... And he's he's nailed it now. He gets the headlines every week for something he says on 100% footy every week. And then it gets mentioned on the, on the other channels and the other... So he, he sort of wins the ratings in that sense. He, I think he's a bit of a rugby league Donald Trump, isn't he, in a way? So, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, well said, well said. Mm. Okay, let's move on. Lee, you put a post on your one of your channels. Did I? Around um, there, there was a, a phrase that became famous, at least in rugby league circles, uh, through Jack Gibson and then uh, Wayne Bennett, was the uh, no DH policy. And your post was around whether... Uh, and and I'm, I'm stretching it out and and um, taking it in a slightly different direction here, but around some players being allowed to have concessions or being treated differently because they're more talented and, uh, I guess, given some concessions, et cetera, as coaches. Mm. And, and we do live in an age now, thankfully, and I think a more um, sophisticated age where we have learnt as a society that equality and equity are two different things. Mm-hmm. To what degree should a more talented player be given uh, more leniency or more... Because it happens at the highest level and, and coaches yeah. at the highest level have allowed players for eons that if they perform on Saturday... 
Um, I won't say they can do whatever they want during the week, but they can certainly get away with a lot more during the week. I think the key term is high levels. So there's countless examples of players that, you know, I remember reading stories about Eric Cantona at Manchester United who didn't like to shave or pull his tie up properly. But he was so good that the players understood why Alex Ferguson, the manager, was treating him a little bit differently. I think also he had the work ethic in training that backed it up as well. Well, he didn't have a bad attitude to training. He just didn't conform to sort of some of the uniform rules and some of the other things that the that, that players were expected to do. Steve Renoff in rugby league, uh, there's a famous tale. Wayne Bennett had a chat to him about his intensity in training. And apparently Pearl said to him words to the effect of, do you want me to look intense and run around here at training and get tired? Wayne, or do you want me to get you a hat trick every Sunday? And apparently Wayne Bennett basically said touche and understood from that day that you treat special talents in a special way. I think where it becomes a problem is in uh, teams, you know, A-grade teams, <laughs> and when the, the most talented person isn't anywhere near as talented as they think they are. I think it becomes an issue in any junior teams where you give the wrong life lessons. So my post was pertaining to juniors that have been mollycoddled and uh, had their tyres pumped up constantly and get got away with not murder, but they could break rules and and I think that sends out the wrong message with kids. But I do think there are individuals and good coaches know how to look after individuals. So I've done it in the past with players. You've just made sure the group know why you're doing it and you're just saying, Yeah, I'm just letting Joe Bloggs you know, if he, if he doesn't quite make the mark to this, just give him a give him an easy ride, lads, because you know what he'll do for us on in game day. So it's it's a it's a fine line, but basically with kids, it's a, it's the wrong thing. Do you think also, Tim? I'll throw this to you first, so that you can get a word in edgewise. Uh, do you think <laughs> the rugby league coach podcast <laughs> with, with 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 Tim and Chris? <laughs> Do you do you think that I mean ki- kids aren't stupid and players aren't stupid? Do you think if the player does perform that, as in the player that might be getting the concessions or might be uh, you know getting treated slightly differently? And I'm talking all levels here because kids aren't silly from whatever age; they're pretty intuitive. Do you think that helps with? the coach allowing those concessions if the rest of the players think, well, yeah, because he's a better player to, for me to play beside this weekend and you, we're a better chance of having a win if if he's on deck and he's allowed to do his own thing. Does that – do you think that factors into it? Yes and no because with the, the junior football that I've been coaching, I can only talk on what I've been coaching and with the, the junior levels that I've been with, Yes, some of the the players that aren't as skilled, they see, oh, rightio, okay, yep, I can, if I play with him, if he plays on the weekend, yes, we're more likely to get a win and everything like that. But then I throw it back at them and said, well, why don't you train the same as what and how they train? Because I, me personally, I don't like to sort of cotton, throw cotton wool around certain players unless they I know that if they've got an injury or something like that um, I let some of the things slide but majority of it I don't let slide and I've I've got more sort of respect off a lot of the younger players because like if they've got a busted um, they jarred their thumb and I know about it I make sure that the, the whole team knows okay radio. He's doing sit-ups because he can't do push-ups or yeah. 
he's doing those sort of different aspects of the same sort of drill. And I wouldn't even Tim, I wouldn't even classify that as special treatment. I think that's just smart coaching and, and you know, that's player welfare. So yeah, I agree with you 100%. I, I, I think any, any coach, you know, um, worth half his salt would, uh, would allow a player, yeah, and so if he's got a shoulder injury, he does, uh, he, he does squats instead of push-ups, that type of thing. So yeah. 100%. And the other side of it, Tim, I guess, on the junior side of things, and I know Lee is a big um, uh, spokesperson for the fact that they are consumers and, you know, every kid's parents or every family pays fees to play. Does that factor into it as well? Um, yes, I, I believe it does because everyone's got the same. As much as I, a lot of kids don't get the same sort of coaching from their coaches, some, and I've seen this firsthand, some they'll only do certain moves where it it affects, say, half of the team and the other half don't get that, where you want to try and have everyone involved because no one's perfect. Everyone will drop a ball. It doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you are. You're going to make mistakes. And at a junior level, it's about making sure that you're having fun. Hmm. A lot of teams are more inclined to, we've got to win at all costs, where I believe a team, yes, it's fantastic to win a game. But if you win at the end of the season by coming all together, playing as a team and not individuals, a group of individuals, because you can have three or four individual players that are brilliant, but you put them in a team where that's used to playing as a team and the team just falls apart because these guys are always getting the ball. They're always doing the same sort of thing and they're expecting the rest of the team to pick up. But when someone else does something, they're just left, no, I, I can't be bothered tackling. I've just made two. Like, why do I have to make three in a row? He's only made one. But the set before, that same kid might have made five consecutive tackles. Yeah. And look, I think results in juniors are massively overrated anyway. I, I From my own experience, I, I think it was three or four seasons um, in my early teens, I don't know if we won more than one or two games a season, but I look forward to training every week and I look forward to playing every weekend. And, uh, you know, we might have lost by 30 or 40 points most weekends. It certainly didn't detract from the enjoyment I got from the game. But, mate, that no. was in the days of unlimited tackle and the players were retreating five yards. It was certainly uh, leather footballs, Lee, but yep. not a little Easier more Easier game then, wasn't it, Tim? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sometimes rugby oh. league was played amongst the fighting. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Sometimes. it was about it's it's about junior football. I believe it's about developing these kids and making sure that they enjoy themselves and doing the little things right. Because if you do the little things right, eventually everything's going to click. Now I had a team for two years. I think we won maybe three games in two years. The third year the team was was together. I think we lost one game, mm. one or two games that entire season. But those boys, any time that they were down, they didn't take their bat and ball and, and run off. They got behind the goalpost and they said, Rodio, okay, let's just get back to what we've been working on at training and he trying to help each other. And that is what I think sport and especially like rugby league is, is about, is about helping your mate up and and doing it all together. It's mm -hmm. not about, oh, okay, let's let's just try and get the ball to our winger because he's the fastest in the league, so he's just going to run around people. Yeah. You now, he can only do that so many times in a game before he's absolutely knackered. So, and look, in any sport. competition, in any competition, if you average 12 teams in a competition, only one can win the premiership, and that certainly doesn't make the other, the other 11 teams losers. No, that's it. No. Yeah, well said, Tim. Well said. Um, Lee, I Chris. believe you wanted to uh, talk about the – there's been an idea floated about a Four Nations competition mm. at the end of the year. That was uh, – is that uh, driven by Mel Meninga? I don't know. Um, 
the the four nations that has been leaked to the media, if you like, is Australia, New Zealand, Tonga, and Samoa. I posted it and said yes, please. And of course, I'm aware that England aren't included in that. So I put a suggestion that they start a competition regularly with in- with France. Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and anybody else who wants to on that side of the equator. Of course, England will flog them in the first few years, but I think one of the reasons that France have been allowed to slide, and Scotland and Wales in particular, is that they don't play teams like England regularly. And I also think that English rugby league has fallen quite significantly off the pedestal in terms of Australian eyeballs and bums on seats. I do remember, do you boys remember 2002 Great Britain flew over for a one-off test match at the Sydney Football Stadium? Yeah. And they got absolutely flogged by Australia, 66, 16 or something like that. It was a one-off test on a Friday night. And I remember this because I was working at Wigan at the time. And the players played on Sunday at Wigan, were minibus to the airport, flew to Australia and played for Great Britain the following Friday. Mm. And But the other thing that was telling from that game was the Sydney football stadium was half full. This was 20 years ago, right? Martin O'Fire Fire was on that tour. No, 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 no. no. You're 10 years off. <laughs> it was Chris Radlinski at fullback, Andy Farrell at lock, and oh, yep. that kind of era, right? You're thinking 92. Yep. Okay. And that was a great test series. So in 10 years, Great Britain had gone from a team that were really competitive to a team that got flogged in Australian eyes. And... The other thing that's happened is 50 years, a half a century of no Ashes wins, no World Cup wins by anybody in an English or Great Britain shirt. Yet Tonga have managed to beat Australia in a test recently. Samoa Mm. met Australia in a World Cup final that England couldn't get to. England haven't beaten Great Britain. Great Britain or England haven't beaten Australia in a test match since 2006. So nearly two decades. The English people on my socials will complain, oh, Australia never play us and this, that and the other, blah, 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 blah. But it is still officially the worst period in British rugby league history in that sense. So I don't sit here and feel sorry for England that they're not invited to that table. I think any international football we can get up and running, I see the potential for your Tonga and Samoas and what the can bring. I mean, the stadiums will be full when those two people teams play each other. Um, we've we've all seen it that the atmosphere it brings and the pre match rituals and whatnot. And you know, any international rugby league is good. Of course, yeah. I'd love to see an Ashes series. I'd love to see England or break Britain come down here. But the reality is, I think they'd get the the backsides handed to them. You know, uh, that's the reality of it. That's that's where England is at as a nation. And until it gets more respect on the field, I mean, people are using on social media, St. Ellen's an example, even though half of the team were born overseas. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, what, you know, yeah, it shows English rugby league isn't awful, but yeah, you know, let, let, let St. Ellen's play Penrith in the middle of the year, the end of the year. Let's see what happens then. So, you know, I'm doubling down on that side of it as well. Um, so yeah, I just hope that I hope there is a four nations. I really do. I'd like Don't there to be a six think? nations. Yeah, I'd like there to be six nations. Who are the have other F- two? Fiji and PNG. <laughs> so England don't even get in that one. <laughs> um, no, it, it's only like Southern Hemisphere, sort of Southern yeah, Hemisphere yeah. versus Northern Hemisphere. One of one of the six good suggestions on was both. having two two divisions. Yeah. So the top four, which we just mentioned, and your second tier is Fiji, Papua New Guinea. Possibly Cook Islands. Yep. Um, who else is there down here? Um, maybe it's just those three, you know? Like, yeah. 
but I'm, I'm with you. The more international games yeah. that they play each other, the better off the sport's going to be in general because the more yeah. people are going to watch it. The yeah. more kids are going to want to go, oh, mum or dad, you're from this country. I could end up playing for them and just it would in- ignite the, the love that they have. One of the big things I'd love to see is Pete, is is Australians wanting to wear the kangaroo jersey again? Yes. So kids dreaming of playing for Australia, not because I want Australia to win everything all the time. I don't, but just that, that passion. Yeah, it. The, the Aussie kids are more New South Wales or Queensland. The, the only the only kangaroo they have is in the field or on their plate. You know, they don't think of the kangaroos as. You know, you, you ask every kid on my clinics, who do you want to play for when you're older? None of them say Australia. You know that. No. Um, We're that's a byproduct in. of that's a byproduct of the media's promotion of state of origin as the pinnacle of rugby league. Yeah, but also and, during the time of state of origin, 1980 onwards, two years after 1980s origin was launched, when Artie did what he did, um, Great Britain got absolutely spanked by the Invincibles. On tour, the Invincibles came over and won 10 out of 10 or whatever it was. Won everything and they spanked Great Britain and everything. And then they came and did it again in 86. So, you know, we Mm -hmm. can criticise the media, but, you know, maybe it is the pinnacle. Well, here's just another thing is that, okay, with union, everyone, because I've got a union background, I didn't just want to play for the Reds or the Tars or anything like that. I wanted to play for the Wallabies growing up. Like that was, I wanted to be like some of the Wallaby players. Where today, with Mate, rugby I've seen them play, you might still get a call. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mel does deserve some credit. I think he's gone uh, pretty hard at re-establishing some pride in the Australian jersey. And and uh, before Mel, I think it was it was worse. There was almost. Um, you know, if, if a player had to choose between uh, playing an origin game or playing an international game, they would it would be hands down an origin game and possibly still is. But I think Mal's worked pretty hard to try and re-establish some pride in that. Uh, Mal's been on something like country. eight kangaroos tours mm. as yeah. a coach or player. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just dating. That's right, we'll carry on. Please do. <coughs> yeah, I'll... <laughs> I, I'm with I'm with you on that. Mal's he started to bring back that passion to be a kangaroo and to get some invest some into the younger kids that right, okay, yes, you can play for New South Wales, you can play for Queensland, but you can also play for Australia. Look at Campbell Graham. Hasn't yeah. played for Queensland and New South Wales, he made the Australian team. There's a couple of guys that have actually played for their country before they played for their state. Yep. And I think guys like that has really, really helped with the game and yeah, getting and that I, pride back into a, the Australian jersey. One article I read on the Four Nations uh, proposal was that it was put or, or floated by Mal. So um, I think he's doing a great job in, in trying to get some international footy back on the map, really. Because uh, I, I think it's a great idea. I'd love to see a, a Four Nations series between New Zealand, Australia and Tonga and Samoa. And I, I don't know that Australia would be guaranteed to win. Um, the passion and the, the pride that particularly Tonga have and the momentum that they have. Um, although I guess you could say Samoa uh, overtook them in the World Cup. But I just think it would be so exciting. The atmosphere would be fantastic and the, the the like you said earlier, Lee, the the cultural aspects that it brings, mm. I, I think, bring it on. Yeah, and England get up to scratch. Mm. Yeah, and, like and look, see. is that also the tyranny of distance? The fact that it is such a long way. I mean, that that example you gave, <laughs> flying out and getting on a bus on a Sunday and flying out mm. to play on a Friday, there was no chance they were going to perform at their best in that. In look, those I mean, uh, if they were if they were selling out the, the MCG when they got here, because. There was a chance of them winning. Do you not think they'd be flying them over? Mm. <laughs> you know, like if if they were, you know, if you know that the reality is, it's, it's a commercial decision. It's yeah, absolutely a commercial decision. Samoa and Tonga are worth more bums and seats 
and worth more eyeballs down here. Well, you know, when the British can bleat about it all they want, until until they start lifting their standards and one win over Penrith doesn't make them back on even keel. We've got fifty years to to make up. We we need to British rugby league needs to lift its game. Yep, does that start with the local comp, or does it start with a, a northern hemisphere equivalent of four nations? The the, the the four nations in the Northern Hemisphere won't benefit England in the first 10 years, five years even, because Ireland, Wales, Scotland and France probably won't be strong enough. The people will be, <clears throat> it will benefit those four. Hmm. Um. Look, uh, how English rugby league improves is a, is another ten podcast, Chris. Like, yeah. Um, the I, I have currently got a tear in my eye because I'm having a coughing fit, but I do have a tear in my eye when I think about how rugby league has fallen. I mean, I, I one of my first memories of rugby league was being at the '86 Test match in the Ashes series, Old Trafford. <clears throat> and it's the first time I'd been in the company of Aussies. And I was used to going to Man City with my dad. And there was a bit of hostile stuff go going on at those grounds. And I was at the test match with my dad and an Aussie fan shouting my dad. I was on my dad's shoulders because I was that young. Shouting my dad, got him to turn around and gave me a a badge um, with an Australian emblem on it and a rugby league emblem. And I said, thank you. And I remember saying to me, Dad, like, you know, that's amazing that somebody from the opposing supporter base, has, well, I didn't use those terms, but a supporter of the other team has given me a badge. And they were giving badges out to all the British people. And I remember the feelings I had I remember eight, the 88 series over here in Australia, my dad waking up early and I was already watching it and seeing his face when Britain had won the third test. He was over the moon. And then in 1990 and 92 and 94, we took a test off Australia and genuinely me and so many other people lived for that four-year cycle. And then it got ruined by the Super League war. Mm. So that's that. But what also happened during that time is we blew several chances to to get back to the top of the tree. Uh, England Rugby League received world-class performance funding just like every other sport that competed in the Olympics and it, it, that competed on an on a international level as part of the lottery funding. And that's why Britain have all of a sudden been near the top of the Olympic medal tables for the last few Olympics, because the investment went into those sports. They used it relatively wisely and it's ended up with podium finishes. Well, England haven't been near the podium in rugby league, yet they still got that same bite of funding. If anything, they would have got more funding at that time in the early 2000s com compared to other sports. You know, you, you, some of the biggest cyclists in England now can walk down the streets of Manchester and people will know who they are. The English rugby league captain probably can't. Yeah. You know, so there's so many things that go into that. Um, But yeah, you know, we, we, we can't sit here and having not won an Ashes series for half a century or a World Cup for half a century and think, oh yeah, you know, we should get a game against Australia, like, or we should be in that four nations. Well, we don't have that God-given right anymore. We've not won a test since 2006 anyway yeah. against them. Yeah, and like you said, it's uh, at least 10 podcasts worth. But um, yeah. in, in, in the tradition of the Rugby League Coach podcast, given that uh, it has been just over an hour, 
Lee, and taking your lead from uh, a few weeks ago, I'd like to finish off on uh, a non-rugby league topic, but one where, in my opinion, the British and the English in particular have uh, will still hold the number one spot, and that is in uh, British comedy or comedy TV and uh, British crime series. So okay. I'll give you two guys uh, a moment to think about your best. I'm going to throw a couple at you. My uh, favourite, I'd I love British TV. I grew up on uh, shows like the Dave <laughs> Allen Show, the uh, the two Ronnies, Porridge. Um, All the ones I don't watch. Yeah. The uh, Benny Hill. Benny, <laughs> Benny Hill, yes. Although mum mum didn't like us watching Benny Hill, but uh, when she wasn't around, dad would put it on. And one in high school, which has dated terribly, but uh, sorry, primary school, it was the goodies. And the Kenny Everett yep. video show. And then uh, in high school, there was a show called The Young Ones, which was just absolutely crazy. And it, it was awesome, but ha- hasn't aged well. <laughs> and then uh, then I get, I think we move on to Black Adder and Black Books and Men Behaving Badly and shows like that. So th- throw yours at us, gentlemen. Comedy show. I mean, yours were more, you're sort of talking sitcom type things, really, aren't you? There's, there's one from the last sort of, decade and a bit called Celebrity Juice okay. and it's basically a game show and um, Lee Francis the comedian who has an alter ego Avid Merrion and or oh, used to have Avid Merrion and then Keith Lemon Keith Lemon hosts it and it's basically a funny game show. So there's that. And I'm also a fan of Mrs. Brown's boys, which is obviously Irish, but yes, my, my dad will be listening or watching this and going, Oh, I hate those two. Yeah. But yeah, they're the ones that just tickle me. Um, crime show. Uh, one of the best in recent times have been line of duty. Line yes. of duty. It was getting close to, I think 15 million people watching it in the country at one point. Um, and then, Historically, there's been so many over the years, but yeah, line, line and duty, line of duty certainly caught man. And did you have you noticed as well that all Tim, have you noticed all Chris's were like 1970, early 80s? Mine are like I was giving the historical mine are at least in this century. I was given the historical pe- perspective first, Lee. Got you. I uh, well, so, I do like the eight, eight out of ten cats is another good yeah, one good. along the line. Of I'm a big Jimmy, fan, Jimmy Carr fan. Have a look at Peter K live if you've not seen him. He goes, well. No, I haven't. I haven't. The other yeah. one was, uh, is it Would I Lie to You or Would I? Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty. We just churn Crime them out, wise. lad. We just churn Tim. them out. Tim, Tim. Crime wise, um, I, I don't mind that uh, Looser. That yeah, was good. excellent. Yeah. Um, but comedy wise, Black Adder, Benny Hill, and the goodies. <laughs> Classic. Faulty Towers. That, that yes. deserves a shout too. Yes, Faulty Towers. Absolutely. To can't believe man. For a, a show that only had 12 episodes, unbelievably good. And uh, yeah, it is a favourite with so many people. <laughs> you can't you can't talk British TV without mentioning the soaps as well, like East Enders, 30 odd years, Coronation Street, nearly 60 years. Neighbours. No, that's Australian rubbish, and it, I know, it, but it, it it's doesn't even over there. It doesn't even it's bigger exist over there anymore. than what it is here. That's right. But Coronation Street, fifty odd years, mm. and that's based on my hometown, and it was only piloted for six weeks, and it's been going fifty odd every week for at least three sessions. Coronation yeah. Street, and you know the old Fox tell it and say episode. 8,200 <laughs> <laughs> about um, so yeah so I think I think it'd be close to its 60th anniversary now I yeah. think my Coronation grandma she Street. used to love Coronation Street and there's children so they've like they've gone through the family dynasties kind of thing so these great grandchildren and children in, in the show of the ones that were in it in the 60s so <laughs> well on that note, I think we should probably end it because uh, once you move on to soap operas, you've totally lost me. Well, we've <laughs> got well, all we do is talk about the rugby league soap opera. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of drama. Um, one thing I have discussed with 
His Highness Taylor, who's busy at work getting drunk tonight, is at some function, um, interstate, is that we'll actually all bring topics each week. So, um, you know, let's say I'm hosting. I go, right, Chris, what's your topic? Tim, what's your topic? You know, we do it like that as well. So that's something else we can we can start to do as well, just to, just to spice it all up. Sounds good. And seeing as you're on the technical side of things, Lee, I'll leave it to you to tell us when uh, you're going to stop recording. Probably right now. <laughs>